Hello, and welcome to episode 53 of Public Interest Podcast with your host, Jordan Cooper, where we interview politicians, activists, advocates, and others who seek to improve the state of the world. We're here today with Phil Kaufman, member of the Montgomery County Board of Education. How are you doing today, Phil? I'm doing fine. Excellent. So the first question I'd like to ask you is what are you currently doing or what have you ever done to advance the public interest and why? So I would say there are different things I've done. Uh, I'll, I'll start with actually my, um, my former job where I, I worked for the Department of Veterans Affairs. Okay. I was a contract lawyer there uh, and we did, uh, we did contracting for health care services. And uh, years ago, and I guess I'm now retired there, but uh, Congress passed a law that had to do with how we contract for pharmaceuticals. Mm-hmm. And the VA actually buys the, the pharmaceuticals for the federal government, for both the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, civilian agencies and also uh, DOD buys off of uh, VA contracts. Mm-hmm. And it was a very strange law that was passed. It was one of these that where Congress was trying to do uh, different things, and, and there was a sort of a compromise that was passed uh, between a House version and a Senate version of the bill. It had to do with pricing on um, how we did uh, contracting, and it created a concept called federal ceiling prices for contract for uh, for pharmaceuticals. It fell on my office to administer this particular law. Uh, I had a couple attorneys that were stationed in Chicago, and we basically created a program where over time we literally saved um, tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars in the prices that we paid for, the the government paid for uh, pharmaceuticals. So that's actually really interesting because I'm aware that the Medicare Modernization Act uh, passed in the early 21st century under the George W. Bush administration, created Medicare Part D and specifically prohibited the federal government, in this case, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, referred to as CMS, from the, using the federal government's purchasing power to negotiate down prescription drug pricing. But what you're telling me is the Veterans Administration and... Department of Veterans Affairs. Department of Veterans Affairs and then... By virtue of that, and extent, by extension of that, the, the Department of Defense have actually done the very same thing, negotiating down prescription drug pricing using their hold on the market. Is that what you're saying? Pretty much. And it was interesting because as we would do, I mean, we were doing really great things. It, um, depending on the administration, sometimes folks, you know, the, there's this perception that the government can't do anything right. Mm-hmm. And Why is there that perception? Well, Ronald Reagan's vill- who, who, who knows? Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, but there, there, are, there are those perceptions out there. But we were actually doing a really good job of negotiating with yeah. contractors and getting getting this pricing. Uh, we, and but I would say that there was fear mm-hmm. uh, amongst the uh, the pharmaceutical makers. I mean, the the, the federal government share is really a, that we buy directly mm-hmm. is a small share, and the uh, drug industry was willing. Uh, to deal with VA, DOD uh, for the, the for the drugs that, that the VA bought, uh-huh. that uh, the DOD bought for its direct beneficiaries for Tricare and all. Um, periodically, the White House would call us in and say, "How do you guys do this?" <laughs> because there was a fear that, that that the model we were using would be replicated for Medicare. So, which White House was this? This is probably the Bush White House. Okay, I mean, and, Bush number two. Bush number two. Okay. And so we would explain how, how this all happened. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but uh, you know, it, it, it stayed as a program really for VA buys and uh, or really direct government buys. It never got um, – and Medicaid sort of does something similar, but it was really just for, uh, for, the, for the drugs that we bought. So, I mean, we, we felt pretty proud about the job that we did. It was with, with a relatively small staff in terms of, you know, my office provided the legal advice mm-hmm. on that. So you're an attorney? I'm an attorney. So I was a contract law attorney. That's what I did. And you were an employee or a contractor? Of the I VA? was an employee of the, of the VA. And did you get any recognition for saving taxpayers millions or tens of millions of dollars? No, not really. Not I mean, re- just... you know, when you retire, okay. people say, okay, congratulations, you did a good job. And uh, but no, there was never any. Um, I mean, one of my staff attorneys 
was the guy. And, you know, so he periodically he would get recognized by DOD. He mm-hmm. would get different, uh, you know, and we, we, we allowed, you know, I mean, it, it was fine in terms of uh, the recognition. But, um, but anyway, so, I mean, I felt it's one of those things where you look at, okay, you know, in my government career, that was, I'd say, a win. You felt, you, you felt like, I felt like after I retired that I did something uh, good from that, from that. So would you consider yourself to have been, or would you have considered yourself to have been a bureaucrat or a civil servant or category C, something else? Well, I'm, I was a career employee. All right. So, not that's a bureaucrat. I mean, some you know. I mean, I would say that some people call that a bureaucrat, but I mean, I was just a, a career employee, mm-hmm. uh, not certainly not a political appointee. Um, so, how did you get involved with the Veterans Admin- with the Department of Veteran Affairs? So, after I graduated law school in '77, I initially uh, I went to U- University of Maryland uh, in. Uh, in, Balt- in Baltimore, where the law school is, mm-hmm. I initially um, was hired by the uh, Corps of Engineers, mm-hmm. and, and I did contract law there for a couple of years. And then, um, you know, being a, 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 a an attorney in the field outside of Washington, the pay is not as great as it would be in the D.C. area. And I eventually, you know, got a job doing contract law uh, uh, back in 1980 uh, with the Department of Veterans Affairs. And, uh, and just moved here and ran the uh, career and sort of uh, was was there for uh, you know 35 years now your career really politically pivots upon the or is premised somewhat upon the idea that you have children and those children eventually received an education is that correct that is correct and so but you know there are many individuals who happen to have children and whose children go into the school system in fact at any given time there are about 150,000 um, students in Montgomery County Public Schools. Right now, 159,000. 159,000. And you, you know, roughly could say about 300,000 or so individuals are the parents of those students. Um, and yet, you ran for Board of Education. So, so many of those parents are not running for Board of Education, but you did. At what point? Did you realize that political office would be for you? What was the run up to your decision to run? And um, what have you been able to accomplish? So I'd say just going back to that for that particular role, you know, I'd say a a public public servant, all that. I got involved in schools as a PTA volunteer uh, in in my community. Uh, Most, you know, I mean, my my children went to schools in, in the Omni area. Uh, and we were involved. I mean, when, when we first moved to Omni, uh, it was sort of a tumultuous era for our uh, area of the county in the Sherwood Cluster. There was a several year um, process by which the folks in the Sherwood Cluster were lobbying for a new school to be built for in the uh, Sherwood Cluster. Mm-hmm. And a new high school, or a, new, a new elementary school, elementary school. Uh, a lot of growth in that area back then. And at the same time, there was a lot of, you know, they were building a new high school, which became Blake High School. Uh, and uh, the new high school was to relieve overcrowding at uh, Sherwood, Paint Branch and Springbrook. And what age were your children? Or- so my kids at that time were just in the elementary schools. OK. And. So my focus really was, you know, getting involved in the in the uh, the lobbying and the advocacy around uh, the elementary school. Why did you feel like you needed to get involved? If you would have just sat back, didn't you think someone else might take care of it? I mean, we, there were lots of you know friends and all that. I mean, it was just you know the, our PTAs got involved, so I was part of the PTA, and we were just all involved. I mean, you know, within the folks in our cluster, in terms of going to board of ed meetings, county council meetings, just sitting there with our signs saying we, you know, we needed a new elementary school. So I mean, we it. had we had bumper stickers, sure, with six and ninety six, and you know, and it, ultimately it turned out that we didn't get. The new elementary school. So you became a disappointed civic activist. I became a disappointed <laughs> civic activist, and uh, we felt like the uh, the you know the, the board and the county council were passing us back and forth. I mean, the board would blame the county council for not funding the school. The county council would blame the board for not advocating for the school. And I guess as a civic as a community, we felt like our 
Um, the board and the county council weren't representing us well. They weren't talking to each other. It was, just became a very frustrating experience. Mm -hmm. And at the same time in our community, there was a lot of concern about uh, the creation of the Northeast Consortium. What was that going to look like? What is you the know? Northeast Consortium? So the Northeast Consortium, as it's turned out, is a consortium now of three schools. It's Blake, uh, Springbrook, and Paint Branch, where... Uh, those are our high schools? Those are high schools, and students are, are assigned a base area. So everyone that lives within the boundaries of those three areas are assigned to a school, but then annually you're given your oppor an opportunity to choose your school. Hmm. So there's a lottery process. So you're guaranteed, you're, guar you're guaranteed your base school, but then you get to choose uh, one of the other schools, and each school has distinctive signature programs. So uh -huh. Blake may have a, has a performing arts program. Uh, Paint Branch is more into health healthcare careers. Springbrook is more technology and IB, and those programs were created as a way of uh, moving students around. Are students driving that change, or are the parents driving where the students go? Are there really many 14-year-olds saying, I really need to be in the pre-health career high school? I'd say it's a combination of the, you know, this, this, you know, I mean, the, the student choice, but I think the parents are also involved. But, mm -hmm. and, this, and there's a similar program in the Down County. So there you have five schools in the Down County Consortium. So it's Blair, Einstein, Kennedy, Northwood, and Wheaton. So it's the same, the same model. But the mm -hmm. Northeast Consortium was the first model. It was very contentious at the time. Originally, Sherwood was supposed to be part of the Northeast Consortium. Um, a lot of this was being driven at the time by how do you balance the demographics of the communities. The Sherwood area was considered was you know far whiter and mm -hmm. less uh, less diverse. And you know the idea was how do you get students from you know without um, the boundary process of just drawing boundaries for the new high school. If the, if the system had just drawn boundaries for Blake at the time, given the location of where Blake was, mm -hmm. Blake would have looked like it would have probably drawn a lot of the white uh, and middle class populations away from Springbrook and Paint Branch. Uh, and the system, that's why the system was creating this consortium to try and balance demographics through a, a choice process as opposed to just forcing, um, you know, boundaries that... Um, so was there almost implied segregation is what you're saying? Well, I mean, if, if, if we had, if the system, I mean, I wasn't, obviously I wasn't a decision maker at the time. I mean, if the system had just drawn boundaries, I think it would have created a more uh, unequal, um, you know, Distribu demographic, distribu distribution. demographic distribution at the new high school that, they, that the system tried to avoid by, um, by doing a, a choice Model. Do people self-segregate demographically? Do you tend to have communities of one demographic or another in certain areas of the county? Absolutely. I mean, yeah, there's, de there's so definitely... So people self-segregate in a way, and then the schools are trying to, would you say, intentionally or potentially artificially make it more diverse within a student body for the benefit of the students? I think that is the goal, to try and avoid drawing boundaries that create... Because it's part of the education process for uh, one student um, of a certain background to be exposed to another student of another background. Correct. Okay. So, um, so there was this whole process. So there was this. There, so there was this process that was being proposed, and there were folks that were unhappy uh, with how this was, um, you know, between the elementary issue and the um, high school issue. It, it created a lot of concern in, in our community. Mm -hmm. uh, what we ended up, uh, I wasn't the leader, I was one of the leaders, I eventually created a, uh, a PAC called the Northeast Montgomery Political Action Committee. And there was the sense that the goal of our PAC was going to be electing folks to the Board of Ed and the County Council that mm -hmm. would represent our community because there was the sense at the time that, well, I mean, if you look at the Omni, greater Omni community in our area of the county, we weren't represented on uh, on the board or on the county council. And uh, so, so, did you each make personal financial contributions to this political action committee? There was a, a limited amount, but um, it, well, it, I mean, we did other things for fundraising. Okay, uh, but it was uh, it was actually 
fairly successful for several years. Uh, we, you know, we did endorsements in Board of Ed and County Council races, all the elected officials. I mean, to have a nonpartisan citizens group mm -hmm. that would get involved in politics, would, you know, make endorsements, would work the polls, uh, would support different candidates. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot, a lot of times candidates, after they would get endorsements by our group, would actually contribute to the pack because they knew, you know, we would use those, you know, those funds to get the word out that, oh, you know, we support yeah. such and such, you right. know, for, you know, for elected office. So, so that would be third party validation that would help those candidates increase their credibility in the eyes of voters. Right. Absolutely. Okay. So, um, so that I, I'd say for several election cycles, you know, that, you know, our pack survived. I mean, eventually things sort of, and we got involved in issues other than just school issues. We were, you, involved, were you able to get what you wanted, basically? I mean, were you, over time, were you able to see that, well, what was it that you wanted with this Northeast Consortium? You wanted more integration of students with the boundaries? Well, I think with the, I think we ultimately, we, well, with the Northeast Consortium, that's what the school system wanted. I think that there were concerns when the, after the consortium was created, there were folks, there were kids from Sherwood that were assigned to uh, the new school. The question was whether or not, at least for the first year, some of them could have stayed at Sherwood. I know that was a big issue back then. But I, th I think from the, I, th I think going forward, that that group was more like as um, as new issues come along, new well, you know, new facilities yeah. issues, growth issues. We just wanted to make sure that our community. Was represented. So, what was the biggest, I guess, win for this political action committee of yours? You know, it's it's hard to say. I think just the fact that folks knew about us and considered us, and um, you became a player. We were a player. And did you have an impact on policy? It's hard to say. I mean, I I think that I think that folks certainly were aware of us and had to consider our. You know the the points that we were making on on different issues and factor in you, our con, our concerns. You gave your neighborhood a seat at the table. Absolutely. So then, eventually, somehow, you became the guy representing all me. So, so, so eventually, you know, I became act, more active than I probably would have otherwise been in PTA. And this is an addition to your job at the this VA. This is an addition to the job. So at this the is VA. like evenings and weekends. This is evenings and weekends. Okay. So, in addition to the job at the VA. Uh, you know, so I became a president of the Farquhar PTA. I was, you know, just went up the uh, up the ladder in terms of PTA um, positions. So, became from a uh, PTA president to a cluster coordinator to an area vice president, uh -huh. and you know, all the while my kids are growing up in the system, and uh, you know, so then we got to the point where my kids were. Um, graduating, aging out of the system. And, yeah. and the question was, well, do I want to continue as a PTA person? Right. Or do I want to take what I've learned and uh, get involved in uh, Board of Ed? And that's really where I made the choice uh, to um, sort of take what I learned and, um, you know, and run for Board of Ed. I actually put it, there was actually two times there was a vacancy on the Board of Ed, I guess, when uh, Reggie Felton, who was on the board... Uh, left the board because he moved there. So there was an opening mm -hmm. uh, that um, uh, the way it works, the board, if there's an, a vacancy, the board can appoint to fill a vacancy. I mm -hmm. put in for the vacancy uh, and, but I wasn't chosen, but then I sort of got, okay, well, you know, I started to think about, you know, whether or not this is something I really, you know, do I really want to do the campaigning, the electioneering and all that? Um, so I did run in 2006. So I ran against Nancy Navarro, who, uh -huh. who actually did get appointed uh, to the seat back in, in 2006 when uh, when there was a vacancy. I lost then, but then, you know, then the at-large seat opened up in 2008 and I ran then and, then, you know, I was successful. So you've been on the Board of Education for eight years. Eight years. So two Two year term, two four year terms, and let's see. And so you hadn't had necessarily a lifetime calling for politics, but through the interests of your children, you developed an expertise in a certain policy area, became aware of the community's concerns, and then used that expertise and knowledge and previous advocacy experience 
to become an elected advocate yourself for those same changes. That's basically the I'm process. basically saying I went from being the one switching positions from being someone advocating to being someone deciding because I felt like you know, I, that's... So what was it like to be on the other side of the table and to have other people from around the county advocate for changes and, and trying to convince you to change your vote? So it was interesting. It, look, it's an interesting process. And it's, um, you know, I felt, I felt prepared in a sense, but until you really get into the seat and realize how, you know, I knew my little area of the county, you know, yeah. um, and I think I, I came in with a good understanding of, you know, what is our budget, our operating budget, our capital budget. Uh, but it certainly was, you, you learn so much or you learn so yeah. much about what you don't know uh -huh. once you get in there. But yeah, it's it's definitely, it's interesting. And But I think it, it sort of helps because you can sort of filter out sometimes, you know, what's the agenda of... You know, of uh, folks when when they are advocating on different issues. Um, what was your agenda? What were you trying to do? What was your top priority? You know, it's hard to say. I mean, I came on. You know, so I mean, there would be things where I would be frustrated. You know, watching the board. What would you know? frustrate you? Uh, sometimes I would think that when staff would give responses, they would maybe they would influence. A board's decision based on the responses that sometimes that there would be half of an answer or half of a truth and you sit there while and, you're an advocate or well, a member well, 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 well i'm an advocate while and, you're, you're, and you say you know they're not really telling the whole story here uh -huh. and maybe if they really told the whole picture there would be a difference um I think there was, you know, like I said, there was the frustration at the time of why doesn't the council and the board just talk to each other? I mean, so they point fingers and, you know, and can't there be a better process by which um, these decisions are made? Because it seems like decisions are made in, in a vacuum and silos and just a frustration as a community member watching watching our elected officials point fingers at each other and blame each other. So then that. I got in there, and that's one of the things I was saying, okay, let's... Structural stru stru problems. Structural problems, you know, how do, how do you fix these things, you know? And how like, did you do it? Or did you do it? You how, many, you, how many members are on the Board of Education? So there are seven adults and one student member. Okay, so board. eight members of the eight board. Eight members of the board. And you're one of eight, and then how do you... But of course, the student member of the board doesn't vote on the budget. He does now. Oh, he does now. Okay, so could even be a tie. Could even be a tie. But so you have... a whole conversation for another, <laughs> for another day now. So we're, we have structural frustrations. We have staff that aren't telling the whole story. When you or were there... At least the perception is that you're not telling the whole story. Did you change that when you were there? So you, t you attempt to change that. You know what I mean? I, and I think... And that's been something that over time we have tried to chip away at uh, in terms of uh, the answers that we get um you know, it can be you know the way the board is set up um we said we have seven eight we counting the student member we have three professional staff uh-huh and oh wow it's not very much it's not very much and so we rely on the superintendent staff really how to, many does he have well i mean he's got you know, I can't say. I mean, he's got. I mean, more in terms than three. Of, more than three. I mean, in terms of his budget office, in terms of facilities, in terms of all the folks that 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 support the superintendent. Dozens of people. Yeah, dozens. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Not less than a hundred. Yeah. More I, than twelve. Right, right. Okay. Lot, lots of folks. Okay. Uh, you know, if we ask questions, you know, depending on trying to say who who in the system is actually preparing the answer. But, but who hires and fires the superintendent? The board fire, hires and fires the superintendent. So he's accountable to you. So he is accountable to the board. But uh, yeah. but you know, but structurally, so you come on the board and you're okay, the new board member, and you say, oh, I want to fix this. And yeah. You quickly. Well, you know, who are you? Yeah. You know, and you know, we have a very successful system here and we've done things a certain way for many years and there is no argument, or at least I don't think there's much argument that we are 
were, especially when I came on the board, one of the most successful school systems in the country. So there's not too much you want to change and rock the boat because you're, you don't want to mess with success. I mean, you, you want to come on and say, I want to fix things. But I think there's this pushback of... Don't fix it if it ain't broke. Don't fix it if it ain't broke. You know, we got this way doing things in a certain manner. We had a very successful superintendent when I came on, Jerry Weist, who was had a way of doing things. You know, for when I came on, he had been superintendent for 10 years. So so there was a way in which things got done. So to... Is it, to, is it fair to say that one of the greatest responsibilities of a member of the Board of Education in Montgomery County is to just keep the operations going and make sure that you maintain the system? Well, certainly you don't want to break the system. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's really, you know, that's, I, I think that's really the, the, the um, Progress is the nice, the but challenge. you want to prevent backsliding. You, yeah, right. You don't want to, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But at the same time, you know that there are challenges. You know there are things that you come in and say, okay, you know, can't we do things better? Uh, and but that's the challenge of ha you know as a single board member coming into a new board into a board that has a way of doing business as a system that's doing business you know how do you um, how do you really effectuate change so we're nearing the end of the podcast and just like to ask you for a moment to reflect on your years of service why is it that you've done this? Clearly, how much do you get paid as a Board of Education member? So I was on the old pay, pay scale. It got increased, but I was getting paid 18000 $18,000 a year for what could potentially, in terms of time commitment, be a full-time job. Easily, but it's Easily in, a full-time job. In, a, in addition, actually, to your real full-time job. So why? So you try to make a difference. You know, I mean, I, you know, I was, I've always been pretty proud of the fact that I was, okay, on the governing board on, I would say one of the best schools, you know, Maryland has one of the best, you know, claimed as one of the best state school systems around. Mm -hmm. And I think Montgomery County is probably the jewel in that the, crown. The jewel in that crown. So you could sit there and say, this may be the best system in the country. Yeah. Hard to say. I mean, it's hard to, you know, but based among on the best. what, among, certainly among the best. So there's a certain element of pride in saying, okay, I am part of the governing body of a system that is probably one of the best. So I think I can take, you know, pride in that. I think that, you know, despite whatever challenges we've had over the last, you know, eight years of time that I've been on the board, I mean, there, you know, yeah, absolutely, we've had challenges. But I think that to the extent that I have, Anything that I've advocated for, differences we made in terms of how the board operates, the relationship with the superintendent, mm -hmm. the relationship with our staff in terms of um, funding decisions we've made uh, and all that. You know, I, I'm, I'm pretty proud of, uh, of what I've done and, uh, you know, it, it just gives me pleasure. So that has been Phil Kaufman, at-large Board of Education member for Montgomery County Public Schools, who speaks about service... Um, uh, taking pride in service, uh, being able to facilitate the delivery of a high quality education to students in one of the largest and highest quality school systems in the United States and being a part of some enterprise that's greater than yourself that is successful at delivering such high quality services to its beneficiaries, to students, uh, is something that's worthwhile. So that has been episode 53 of Public Interest Podcast with your host, Jordan Cooper, where we interview politicians, activists, advocates, and others who seek to improve the state of the world. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll talk to you next time.